I can tell the story of my own grandfather, my father's father, who came from Russia around the turn of the century. I never knew why. It was, it was just a question of opportunity to, you know, live a better life. He had a push cart and he used to take that push cart and collect used furniture, junk and all that stuff and, and sell it. And, and then after a while, he had enough money to open up a store. But, but that story, that story of my own grandfather is the same story of all these, so many of these other people who came to, uh, uh, came to Oklahoma. There was a stimulus at one time, and that is the exploration for oil that drove a lot of people to come to Oklahoma. They were people looking for a better life. And, and, and they left Europe for the reason, that reason, and they left the towns in which they originally settled when they came to the country, if it wasn't here in Oklahoma. My feeling about it is that all of these people came, and they came for their own reasons and looking for their own rewards but they came from a tradition that says you make the world better. So part of it might be from this, uh, this concept that we were a dispersed people, uh, scattered to the four corners of the earth. And uh, wherever we find ourselves, it's our duty to engage, to get in, to make certain that we are active and trying to do things uh, within our power to make that community better. That we feel linked vertically in a very strong way, right? Even though I am a, a minimalist when it comes to genetic things, and I don't think I am actually the descendant of Abraham who lived in Genesis chapters 11 through 25, okay? I don't actually believe that, but in another real sense, I am very much the descendant of Avraham Avinu, he's saying Hebrew, Abraham, our father, and I feel strongly that my son feels that way too, you know, that he should also at least, whatever he chooses in life, I want him to at least appreciate, you know, the tradition that he's, um, that he's an heir to. is a lovely phrase, Lidor Vador, from one generation to the next, and it means that I'm building for my own life and I'm building for the lives of the people around me, but that I want some part of this to flow across generations so that we communicate with each other and we also speak a word into the universe as a whole and hope that our own descendants will hear that word and act out its demands. Jewish history um, from a pretty early period, let's say maybe the 6th century BCE, has been divided between the lands of Israel, uh, where Judaism began, and uh, the diaspora, that is the scattering of Jews. And the Jewish diaspora would include pretty much the length and breadth of the Roman Empire, and that was big. But then there was a, a major event happened in Judaism in uh, the first century BCE, and that's when there was a rebellion in Judea. And in uh, AD 70, Romans, in fact, destroyed Jerusalem with the destruction of the temple that changed Jewish religion. And now the center was in the synagogues scattered in cities throughout the empire. By the end of uh, the 18th century, uh, probably the most decisive thing that happened was the large Jewish population in Poland was divided between three uh, empires. And in Russia, if you were unfortunate enough to wind up in that third of the three three part division, so then you lived under the czars. I would put it this way always. There are three, I call them the three Ps poverty, 
uh, persecution pogroms. So first of all, the biggest driver of leaving Eastern Europe was poverty. And the reason we can say this with some confidence is because even in Austria-Hungary, so we're about 250,000 Jews, maybe a little bit more, who left. But those 250,000, 300,000 Jews living in Austria-Hungary, they were not the direct victims of persecution, they, but they were poor, and they knew there was better opportunity to be found to the West. And then there were many uh, persecutorial laws. You could just say discrimination, but it's really harsher than that. Uh, they created a, a gigantic area called the Pale of Settlement in which Jews were permitted to live. It resembles the notion of a ghetto in the sense that it is a restricted area to which Jews are confined. It's a much larger area, however, right? It's not a specific part of a city or something like this. It's a very broad area. But nonetheless, the principle is the same. You know, you can't live here, but you can live here, right? And that's obviously restricting your freedom of movement and restricting all kinds of economic possibilities and so forth. Um, so it is a kind of ghettoization, I would say. So let's say at this time, St. Petersburg and Moscow offer a lot of economic opportunities. Well, you can't, le you can't go there, you can't move there and find a job legally. You can, and Jews did do it illegally, but again, they were illegal aliens who could have, like illegal aliens in the 21st century America, it's always precarious. My father, he was a printer for the czar. He was able to be in uh, certain areas because he worked for the czar, where Jews had to live in what they call a shtetl. I think in those days in Russia, all you could do is get a job anywhere you can and could feed your family. And I guess my father was well-read and so forth and learned the, the trade. In 1881, you have um, reasonably wide outbreaks of what are called pogroms. That's just a, a word that's coined. Uh, and it's a Russian word. It means uh, spontaneous outbreaks of violence. The pogroms. Oh, Jews were safe in hardly in any place in Europe in those days. Come charging into town on horseback with drawn swords and kill as many people as they could and charge out. My great grandmother, uh, she was here. I was a teenager, and I took her to the to the Delman Theater to see this movie. And there was a scene in it where they have a pogrom. She jumped up and ran up the aisle, and I had to chase after her. I couldn't imagine. She had lived through one, and it was just more than she could handle watching it. And most of the Jews in this country date back to the families that came here to escape the pogroms. There was a lot of push, but there was also a lot of pull. I mean, the magnetic element of America, because if you have maybe two and a half million Jews, 1881 to 1914, the start of the First World War, well, in that same period, you have more than twice as many Italians. <laughs> Nobody's going into Genoa or, or Palermo and, 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 you know, and, and, and killing people. You know, that's not happening. So this, the pull of uh, in industrializing America is very, very important in this story. Well, the first Jewish person, according to uh, the evidence that we've been able to gather, came here in 1865. And he was a man by the name of uh, Boggy Johnson. Now, he, first of all, Boggy Johnson doesn't sound like a Jewish name. And he settled in a place called Boggy Depot, which is down in Atoka County. Now, the question is, did he become Boggy because he lived in Boggy Depot? Or did he, would he, he give his name to the town? But he was the first. The first real community that uh, was created in, uh, in Oklahoma was Ardmore. And at one time, it had a substantial Jewish population, and they built a synagogue down there, and uh, it, was, it was interesting. And that was a larger town at the time, too. There were lots of small communities that had a few Jewish people. And uh, 
uh, they were they were a hardy bunch. You know, they had come to the state and in, in uh, to raise families and uh, to make a living. It was n not terribly easy to do. Some of them came, you know, about the same time as the uh, as the land run. Some of them came before that. And it was said that every town had to have its juice store because that's the place you went to buy your fabrics to make your clothing with and the other things that you needed to set up housekeeping and what have you. And, and it was the Jews that did that. My mother came in through Galveston and my grandfather had a store in Valley, Oklahoma. It was still Indian territory. My uh, father, how he got to Oklahoma, I, supposedly he had a horse and buggy and he was selling wares. You know, when you live in a community and you and you say there are four Jewish families, and the, and there's bound to be a difference when, and rather than growing up in a community where there's nothing but Jewish families, they had their own schools and their own uh, temples. I went to that Methodist Sunday school, you know, so there's a, there was a great big there was a great difference. What you've got here at the synagogue is a group of people who had command of resources that exceeded other similar communities very early along. So if you take a look, for example, at the founders of B'nai Amuna, they are not, by and large, merchants or peddlers. They are people involved in the oil industry. Tulsa is a place where a typical pattern is overturned. If you were to ask me to tell the story of the founding of Jewish institutions in this part of the country, I would say reform. German Jews first, and then a secondary congregation of Eastern European and Russian Jews who come second. In Tulsa, B'nai Amuna is not secondary. It's a Latvian, Lithuanian Jewish congregation, but it's not secondary in any sense of the word. These are well-resourced and generous Jews from the very beginning. They build a synagogue at 9th and Cheyenne. On the day it opens, on the new year in 1960, 400 Jews show up in the city and from the surrounding small towns. So they're used to living their Jewish lives at a scale probably above counterpart congregations in other places in this part of the country. Many of the early Tulsa Jews were scrap dealers. And oil wells in those days were very shallow and short-lived as far as production. When the oil well kind of petered out, the dealer would take the equipment and move it to a new location. But he sold the hole and the pipe as is in the well. The dealers would pull the pipe, clean it up, and sell it. When the oil prices came up and the new technology improved the recovery, those wells became rather valuable. Many, many of our people in the, uh, that were in the pipe business uh, graduated uh, to the oil business because they would rent the pipe for dr drilling the well and uh, for a percentage of, of the oil if it was successful. And that's how a lot of us got into the business. Part about holding tensions in check is an important aspect of Jewish life in Tulsa. And it applies to the community at large. It means not taking things away, but adding to. So there might be two different services at a given moment in the history of the congregation serving different constituencies. It might mean that there are two people officiating in different parts of the life of the 
the congregation. One a little bit more traditional, one a little bit less traditional, one a little bit more progressive, one a little less progressive, so that everyone finds a place to plug in. The history of frontier communities is not a history of lone individuals, gunmen standing on a ridge looking down at an open plain. It's people finding a way to build community with one another, sometimes involving people who are very different from each other. You have Native Americans, you have Anglo settlers. Somehow, these people come together to establish communities that work because they have to work, because we have to somehow find a way to move forward in history and establish communities that will support us all. I think that that has to come uh, from uh, a sense of gratitude to a, a large degree. I mean, these are Jewish families and, and emigres uh, who came to Tulsa either fleeing the pogroms of the 1880s and 90s uh, to Tulsa uh, or fleeing the Holocaust. And there's clearly a sense of of giving back to the community that, that took them in when they were at risk and you know had virtually nothing. There was one gentleman, I always called him Mr. Jankowski. He ended up with palace clothiers. And he came to town with a pack on his back and was selling piece of goods. But he ended up in the clothing business. He was 16 years old when he came to this country. Totally self-educated person coming here. Uh, he had a tremendous love for philosophy. And the other thing he loved was trees. He loved them so much that he planted a tree median all the way down Madison Avenue. He had an opportunity to buy one corner of 4th and Main Street. Whatever the Tulsa newspaper was at, ran an editorial saying, goodbye, Simon Jankowski, you're leaving Tulsa. Tulsa will never grow to 4th and Main Street because Tulsa was supposed to grow in north into the hills, Osage Hills. And uh, they were wrong because 4th and Main Street became the heart of downtown. You know, that, that, that was out in the sticks <laughs> at that point. The immigrant Jews who come to Tulsa aren't farmers and they aren't ranchers. They're merchants. And they build stores and the stores become a street and the street becomes a city block and all of those blocks together become a town. They begin to bump up against their neighbors and the same thing happens on the other side of the divide. That for me is the American experience. Dating back centuries, there were laws that excluded Jews from many professions. Um, and there were laws that excluded Jews from owning land. This accounts for some of the professions that Jews pursued. What are the professions that you typically associate with Judaism? Um, and commerce and trade and tailors uh, uh, are, are, these are, these are fairly historic um, and in part determined by what Jews otherwise couldn't do. I was told from the time I was a little kid to have a trade. They can take almost everything from you, but they can't unteach you. Our grandfather was a bench tailor and is originally from Russia. They had a tailoring academy in Russia, and they made uh, uniforms for the Tsar. In the late 1800s, the first wave of Fadums, noticed they didn't have last names. They came in and they said, what's your occupation? And, and they didn't know, they said, food them which meant thread we with tailor. Thread. We work with thread. There's a man in town, for instance, that has a shop. Now, he is, uh, was in Auschwitz for years, but his father and his grandfather taught him tailoring. And he survived because he had a trade. So they took us from this place and sent that to Auschwitz. Auschwitz was 40 miles square. A lot of college boys from Warsaw, they put them in the coal mines. Three months, all of them was gone. After two, three days, they came out, shoemakers we need, 
tailors we need. And we start making the uniform, not for the soldiers, but for the SS. And Hitler came to power in 33. And so my parents decided that they didn't want to bring a Jewish child to life in Nazi Germany. When my uncle, my mother's brother, graduated from Frankfurt Law School, he was already disbarred for being Jewish. And so he emigrated to England immediately. He wrote to my parents and said, it wouldn't have to be German, it could be British. And so I was conceived with the idea that my mother would go to England. And so she went to England and I was born in London. And then my father came over after I was born. And then we lived in Blackburn until January 40, when our number came up to emigrate to the United States and arrived in New York and then came directly to Tulsa because that's where the man who signed our affidavit lived. In those days in Lithuania, being Jewish was not an asset. The Russians and the Germans, everybody was coming back and forth and unfortunately, Jews were, there was a great deal of anti-Semitism. And they moved into uh, slowly, person by person, uh, into the United States, five of which ended up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The Sandfins, uh, there were five brothers. They came in, uh, they moved to Tulsa in 1919 and were fabulously uh, successful, Oklahoma Tire and Supply which later became Otasco. Their business flourished and grew because they sold anything anybody wanted to buy, and in those days they didn't have too many stores to buy from. Uh, there was, at that point in time, there was a lot of stuff in the oil business, and they were able to sell tires and parts to people that were the truck drivers and other people that were involved in their businesses. It, it's part of the basic philosophy of the Jewish religion. I am my brother's keeper, and the philosophy that you have to take care of the poor, that philosophy spilled over into many of the uh, benefits, baby bonuses, retirement fund, which the employee didn't even pay into. They felt they needed this for the employees. And it built a uh, bond between the employees and management. My grandfather had a farm and they didn't have a public school system, so they would hire the teacher to come and live on the farm. Gershon was the oldest, and he was a, a Hebrew school teacher there, and he taught uh, the, the boys and, and the girls the Hebrew in Lithuania. And uh, he married one of the girls, Rivka, and uh, he finally uh, joined the Otasco and became one of the, the main people. Uh, and, one of the, and he was again one of the smartest people you ever want to meet. And everybody adored him. I mean, from the warehouse up, people would meet me and say, oh, your father-in-law was so brilliant. Traditional Jew would have called Gershon Fenster a Richtiker Yid a real Jew, a righteous Jew. Abraham Frug came to the Oklahoma Territory in 1898, and he opened up these sort of push carts with necessity items and started to sell. My grandfather opened the first Frug store downtown in 1929, and that's 
the year of the Depression, which is interesting. I, I just, what I remember is, is being with him downtown and, and experiencing the store itself with, through his eyes. Well, I mean, to go downtown anyway was an experience in Tulsa, Oklahoma in the 50s. It was an environment that was different than any other store I've ever been in in my life. It was a home experience, more so than, it was, it was that feeling, it was, it was a home to, to the people that worked there. They, they were a community, they were loving. Downtown was alive, I mean, you know, it, it, was, it was the place to be. The center of downtown was really downtown. The shopping was all there. You went downtown for everything. It was Jewish downtown. It, it was amazing down there, especially in, during the holidays. Um, oh, Brown Downtown Duncan, was Vandiver's. Frugs, Redbergs. There, were, there was a tailor, Sherman Ray, Otasco, Brenner's, King's Jewelers, the Aptax, the Goldsteins, the Moskowitzes, Globe Clothers, Nat Hyman Furs. I believe the Louisiana restaurant was owned by a Jewish family. I don't know. Because that's the only place my grandmother would take ate. us to eat. Yeah. <laughs> and I think what's interesting in Tulsa history about the Frug stores is that when they, even when they first opened in 1929, and you have to recall that the race riots were in 1921, so it wasn't that much later, that the Frug store was the first department stores to allow whites and blacks to not only shop together, but they work together. So instead of having African-Americans sweep the floors and wash the windows, they had them, they had them being salespeople with them. The African-Americans were allowed to shop along with the whites in the fruit stores. They were allowed to try on clothes. This had never happened before. Well, because they didn't discriminate in against me. I can sum it up real easy. Anybody who is, has been persecuted against finds it difficult to persecute another person. We just can't do it. I can't do it. By Jews having been, you know, minorities pretty much everywhere they lived, except for, you know, now in the country of Israel, that it definitely gives um, one a sense of, you know, what it means to not be the majority population. And so, um, you know, the culture definitely teaches about, A, being accepting of difference, you know, Jews in the United States, the Reformed, conservative, modern Orthodox communities are, both because it says in the, in the Old Testament, love thy neighbor. Um, and so just that notion, it appears um, in the Old Testament, I don't know, a couple hundred times, like it's not a minor issue um, that's taught. And it's talked a lot about also at the Passover Seder, um, you know, where we were strangers in the land of Egypt. So this concept that we have been strangers, minorities, and want to be allowed to live. And so live, you know, live and let live is kind of a notion. Um, and so, yeah, I think helping all minority communities and immigrants today has been, you know, a notion that's been alive uh, as a values in the Jewish community. If you go back to the Hebrew Bible, to, for example, um, the book of Isaiah, um, there's a passage in there where Isaiah says, um, uh, the Lord doesn't just want um, uh, animal sacrifices, right, and things like this. He wants you to care for um, the hungry and, you know, f feed the hungry, care for the widow and the orphan and so forth. So that, that whole kind of moral emphasis, right, not just performing religious rituals in accordance with time-honored tradition, but actually caring about other human beings. Julius Rosenwald was indeed someone who was befriended first by Booker T. Washington and made a board member of Tuskegee Institute. And Booker T. asks him for, to send money for five rural schools in Alabama. Because while there may be schools in urban areas, uh, since most African Americans are in agricultural work, the school systems are not encouraging the production of schools for African Americans. It was illegal for them to read in slavery, and they were not encouraging the education of African Americans in these rural areas. So Booker T asked for money for five schools, and he said that, and those schools were built. Then he asked for money for five more. And as you go across the country, you'll see some of them are adjacent to churches, some of them are freestanding institutions. 
Here in Oklahoma, you had 198 educational institutions, 170 so of them schools, also teachers' homes and shops. And the Rosenwald Fund here in Oklahoma also had other kinds of activities around education, uh, teacher training, uh, assistance to historical black colleges, universities. There are very few sources to go to for funding for graduate work. And Dad applied to the Julius Rosenwald Fund and got funding for his graduate research. I think in general it's important to understand that one of the greatest aspirations of African Americans was to learn. They've been denied the opportunity to learn uh, through slavery, and punished if, in many places if you knew how to read and write. So Rosenwald coming in and doing this from Delaware to Oklahoma and Texas and building 5,300 schools between the 20s and the late 40s is a remarkable contribution to the education of the rural African American. Without that, we would not have advanced to the point that we are now. So I cannot overestimate the significance of these schools and these funds to the advancement of African Americans in the first half of the 20th century. The Jewish community in that time, in those years, was not included. It was sort of looked down on. And I went to, uh, we have a, a for Southern Hills, which was a major non-Jewish organization club at that time. And I once went there to swim, and I was never invited again. When I moved from Main Street to my new building, at uh, Third and Boulder, I had a real good customer. And he says, now that you're a building owner, you ought to join the Tulsa Country Club, which was very close to downtown. And I said, that's a good idea. I can run over there for lunch. So I proceeded to give him a check for my initiation fee. And that all of a sudden, a month or two went by, and I hadn't seen my customer. About three or four months later, I ran into him at a grocery store. And he said, I'm so embarrassed. I did not know you were Jewish, and your application was blackballed. After that, I joined Meadowbrook. 1954, okay, Jewish people could not become members of Southern Hills, okay? So there was a group, actually Herb Gussman was probably the driver in that deal, and he got a group of other guys and decided, well, we'll do our own country club. 125 members, and they sold stock. And we built, we every day only had nine holes when we had the clubhouse. And I tell you, we used to have those club nights once a month. It was great. We got guys like Henny Youngman, Steve Lawrence to come. I mean, big name people. It was, it was fun. It was really good. It would be typical in a community like ours to have a small Jewish center reflecting the size of this community. But it's not that way in Tulsa. Zero Campus is a very large facility and it contains within it the Sherwin Miller Museum, Meisel Day School, the Jewish Community Center, the offices of the Jewish Federation, and Zero Point itself, a spectrum of care facility. What I like so much about that arrangement is that it speaks to the ambition of the Jewish community in Tulsa and the fact that it's outward facing. Many of the students at Meisel happen to be members of other faith communities, and the same is true for Zero Point. We try very hard to open our institutions to everyone who needs a place. Mr. Fenster, Gershon Fenster, who did so much, gave Rabbi Kahn 
the little small bronze ark that's in the entrance at the museum. Rabbi Khan told me this. I hope someday that we can have a museum of Judaica. This museum was founded because a group of local citizens went to the World's Fair in New York and there was an exhibit of Judaica, uh, ceremonial objects. They saw this thing and they thought it would be a one really wonderful idea if they could bring an exhibit like that to Tulsa. And they, they brought a collection of, of, I think it was 25 objects or something like that, which were shown at the synagogue. We got to a point where we had so much, as much as many of the people on the board felt really that we needed to stay at the synagogue, it had to be realized that the museum had its own goals. There's, there's plenty of art museums, or, or Jewish cultural museums. I mean, a lot of them focus on the Holocaust where we do have a portion of that, but to have a specifically Jewish art museum in the Midwest where we are is actually very rare, but when it comes to the standards of the shows that we have, the collection that we have specifically like this stuff, is really top of the line um, for any museum, no matter where it's located. Every congregation contains uh, a number of smaller congregations. And there are people who take their prayer lives very seriously and want to engage in some of the traditional functions of a synagogue. And there are other people who see the synagogue mostly as a place to plug in in order to act out the demands of social justice. We run a pro-social bakery at the synagogue that brings together volunteers from the congregation and from the larger community and formerly homeless or intermittently homeless men mentally ill citizens, and we produce a line of cookies. And some of the people who work as volunteers in the bakery never end up in the sanctuary, never end up in the chapel, because that's not their primary Jewish interest. We used to think about synagogues as, uh, as a power outlet, as, as, as one thing. Maybe there was one or two places you could plug in to get what you needed from the synagogue, and the synagogue offered one or two things. It was Jewish learning, it was prayer, a very traditional notion of of what a synagogue might be. More and more we're thinking about a synagogue today and our synagogue in, in Tulsa um, as a power strip, as a set of equal opportunities that are lined up side by side where you can plug in to what you want and how you want. There are those that are coming for worship and prayer. There are those that come for learning. There are those that find their Jewish identity in the social aspect and they come for food. And yet there are those that come because they find it's a way that they can make a difference in the greater community through social action, social justice. Personally, I find it deeply consistent with my own Jewish values of doing what we can while we're here for the limited time we are, you know, to help other people have an equal chance of enjoying their life and learning as much as possible and realizing their full potential. Uh, you know, at the same time, we're committed and I'm committed to growing a better Tulsa. And I'm excited about that. That's a very positive part of my work and my life. But I think the part that's most Jewish about it, about my work, is our work in uh, dealing and addressing and trying to intervene in uh, the world of poverty, making Tulsa a more open place for immigrants, a more promising place for people uh, with the least advantage. I got on the board of the Tulsa Metropolitan Ministries and we helped start the Martin Luther King Day before it was a national holiday. Did lots of good activities and the president of the National Conference of Christian and Jews from New York City came to Tulsa, met with us with the leadership and said, you know, there's something different about Tulsa. There's something very special about Tulsa. Can you write a little best practice kind of thing to let other other chapters know uh, how you go about doing all this and what is it that's made it so good? And we did do a booklet that said that it was the trailblazers who uh, became such good friends and everything and set a tone in the community for um, friendship and civility. It was, it was that little nucleus of, of wonderful. I mean, 
we're blessed. We were blessed. Throughout history, I think, people who eat together, uh, I mean, the word companion itself uh, comes from Latin cumpane, which means with bread. So a companion is one with whom you've shared bread. And uh, if, you, if you sit and eat with people on a regular basis, whether you're talking about terribly significant things every month or not, just sitting and eating with someone, there's something very intimate and personal about eating. And so to sit and eat and visit with each other, then when crises would arise, we knew each other. You know, we, we really knew each other and we could call upon each other for, for support. It's because of the relationships in normal times that enables people to come together to face crises. We had in our community this, this terrible event that one night, some um, vandals uh, went through and upended and defaced a number of gravestones in the cemetery, the Jewish parts of the cemetery. So, you know, how do you respond to a despicable, what we call today a hate crime? Because clearly that's what it was. And so they decided on Sunday afternoon that we would have a, an official act of uh, purifying the cemetery, driving out hatred, and as many people of goodwill coming together as possible uh, for a service together. We were asked, all of this, us who were coming as clergy, if we'd be willing to wear our vestments so that the people could see how many faith communities we represented. The Greater Tulsa was trying to say and to visualize is this kind of hate crime is intolerable to all people of faith. And uh, that's not who we want Tulsa to be. The other component, I think, is growing up in a strong Jewish community in a, in a highly Christian Bible Belt city, which was welcoming and where faith was a bit of a bridge of experience rather than a, a divide. It's a city that has made its Jewish citizens feel very comfortable, appreciated. There are examples of philanthropists from each of our religious communities who we would both say who live their faith, uh, who walk the walk. And uh, those examples that each of us can point to with great pride, I think make Tulsa what it is. I don't know where Tulsa would be without the generous Jewish community here, the generosity of, of these outstanding families to make our city better, our school systems better, our preschools better, uh, our day center for the homeless better, our apartments now for the homeless and mentally ill. They take their stewardship of their resources, that's a Christian word I know, stewardship, but they take stewardship of their resources very seriously and have been ex wonderfully generous with this, with this city. It comes from tzedek, which means justice. And our giving isn't because it makes us feel good, but because we have a responsibility, an obligation to share with those in need. This kind of charity, right? I mean, this, this is the whole idea is, is you know, to give to charity. And, uh, but the notion of caring for your fellow human beings um, is very, very old. I mean, we find it throughout the rabbinic writings, particularly the very long set of discourses known as the Talmud. Um, and uh, I think that Judaism has always had a very deep moral core. For me, 
One of the most important commands of the Torah is to look beyond our own lives to the margins of the field. That's what the Torah says about the way a Jewish community has to enfold and protect and secure the lives of people who can't really care as well as they'd like for themselves. That idea comes to be called tzedakah in organized Jewish life. You have to translate things into the vernacular, uh, so it always gets translated as, as charity, but everybody, and that's a lot of people who know are not satisfied with that translation. I'm not, certainly, because the idea of charity has the idea that, well, you can or you can't as the spirit moves you. You are obligated to do tzedakah. Abraham, in the Bible, he left food in the fields. So poor people, I mean, it is part of the tradition. It's every bit as much a religious obligation, I think most Jews would say more, than keeping kosher or observing the Sabbath. It's, um, uh, it's straight from the Bible. Caring for your fellow human beings. Um, I mean, we find it throughout the rabbinic writings. So that's a very old uh, strain within Judaism, uh, going back millennia. My, my parents always instilled in me that, uh, that we're not here alone and that other people, there are other people that always need help and that every one of our obligation is to help our others when they need help. There was a, a little charity box, a sedaka box, and each family always kept one. And if something good happened, you put money in the charity box and it's something that you were fearful of and didn't want to happen, you'd put money in the charity box. The, the boxes go back to crops, goes back to water. The idea was to share. Didn't have to be monetarily. Again, this goes back to Abraham. Abraham shared, he shared everything and he was willing to do that. And it goes back to those commandments. It didn't start out with a box with money. That was more of a teaching tool that started back after, well after Abraham. I think this was given to me by the synagogue. Gave this to everybody that was 90. Sadaka is, I mean, is charity wherever he goes. There's no real difference between Sadaka and, and Tikkun Olam. Uh, the reason why you'll find the, the difference of, of, in the terminology between generations, uh, Sadaka implies more justice. And they grew up in a very unjust kind of atmosphere. Uh, so it, it depends on the starting point. Uh, an older person born in, in, in Russia or Poland, uh, really, if they, they were starting very, very much you know, beneath, the, beneath the line of, of, of justice. So that's what they spoke about and, and aspired to. Tikkun Olam is just a, you know, it's another phrase which, which implies that, but it comes from a sense of, okay, the world is already good. What can I do to make it even better? Uh, and, and with that kind of focus, it helps us realize what it is that we need to do in, in order to make the world a godly place. And that's what Tikkun Olam really is, making the world a home for God. That really retraces the last 50 years of the Jewish world where coming out of the immigrant generation, it was about uh, you give to the Jewish community because that's what you do. It was my grandfather that, that taught me that. You, you contribute to Jewish Federation, you belong to a synagogue. In some cities, like here, you belong to both. And you pay those dues because you support the Jewish community. If not you, no one will. And that was the value. And then in the 80s into the 90s is when this idea of tikkun olam and our responsibility to the greater world and making the world a better place has kind of evolved. So here we are in a world where there are two very strong values of tzedakah, which is righteous giving or charity, and another value of repairing the world and making it a better place. And we do see it coming together quite beautifully here in Tulsa, where there are several very generous philanthropic families who make Tulsa a wonderful place to be Jewishly. Uh, for a Jewish community of this size, it's amazing the opportunities that we have between Jewish day schools, synagogues, federation, a Jewish museum, 
We have the same opportunities that, that Jewish communities two, three, four times our size are hungry for. If the world is in trouble and needs repairing, if there's something in your community that isn't right, if you see injustice, if you see things that need attention, um, don't feel so burdened that you can't completely cure it so that you are stifled by inaction. Get in, get involved, get in the game, start mixing it up and see if you can't at least bring about some improvement. You don't have to complete the task, but you've got to get in there and get after it and try and, uh, try and move the needle a bit. I think the notion of making the world a better place is a stronger notion. That, um, you know, the concept that, you know, how do you find purpose and meaning in your life and it's like trying to help the world be a better place. One man can make a difference, a person can make a difference, and one has to try. And so I think that that's a very important concept that, you know, you work for something bigger than yourself. And so that's what my philosophy is as well. Our social relationships, part of the just functioning of society. We are no less commanded to take care of the poor of the general community than we are the poor of the Jewish community. I would say it feels a little bit smaller, despite the fact that I know that it is a community that's lost numbers. Every crisis in the oil industry has meant an outflow of members of the community, and those numbers haven't really been made up just yet. But we have lots of hope that that will change and change in pretty short order. Teach for America has been an important boost for the morale and the sheer numbers of Jews in Tulsa. We hope that those young people who come to Tulsa, who happen to be members of the Jewish community, like it well enough to stay. We we do a good job of reaching out and enfolding those people who are here for just a couple of years, but many of them, interestingly, have stayed and become very important to this Jewish community. I'm hopeful and optimistic that, uh, that uh, Tulsa will remain strong, its Jewish community will remain strong for another couple of generations. Uh, hopefully, one would argue forever or hope forever. I don't know how realistic forever is because I think we're doing proactively today certain things that will help guarantee a healthy and vibrant Jewish community for generations to come. If you recruit 50, 75, 100 young families that wouldn't have otherwise been here, here, that makes a difference in a community. That can alter the course of history in a community. People who are intensely involved in Jewish life, in Jewish institutional life, but at the same time want to give and offer themselves to the larger community. I feel like it's Tulsa as a whole, and then specifically the Jewish community. It just feels like when everyone in this town, like everyone like wants something good to happen. And it feels amazing to be in a, in a city and, and part of a community and part of a Jewish community that like genuinely wants people within it and outside of it to succeed. And I think that that's probably what many people feel, uh, that, that there was something outside of just, you know, our own ingenuity, hard work, and smarts that got us where we were, but there was something here that, that helped us along. And uh, it's uh, natural for us to want to want to nurture that back. And, you know, as I say, pay it forward a little bit. We want you involved. How can you help? How can we help? It's like, wow, you're doing this in the community right now? Like, how can we get the synagogue behind you? Like, it was like this magical thing that I didn't know I was, I was gonna find in the middle of the country. <laughs> like, this like this thing called like a Jewish community. I feel a strong um, drive and uh, agency um, to create the kind of community that I wanna live in. And so when I go to a new place, um, I, I feel, I just, I feel dr drawn and driven to uh, be immersed and invest in the community in a way that um, helps make it as, as holy as it possibly can be. It, it's the ideas they represent. It's the, uh, it's the, the things they celebrate. The events of history, the people, and that's more important than any of the artifacts. And the older generation always teaches the younger generation. There is, in God's hope for the world, 
uh, an expectation that I will offer whatever I can because it belongs to God as its point of origin. Peoples, civilizations have come and gone over the years. Uh, you know, here we have this this faith that uh, this people that has uh, has lasted far more, far longer than many other civilizations have. Uh, I would say one of the central reasons, even if we take theology out of it for a moment, that there may have been with God's blessings. And I'm not denying that, but I think a fundamental reason why our people has survived despite uh, great odds and great, great travails many times is that we're focused on teaching the next generation uh, the tenets of our faith, telling our story and passing it down from generation to generation to generation. Oh, that doesn't take much. <laughs> you can sing Shalom. Yeah, go for it, Norm. Shalom, Shalom, you'll find Shalom, the nicest greeting I know. It means bonjour, salute and skull, and twice as much as hello. It means a million lovely things, like peace be yours, welcome home. And even when you say goodbye, your heart says, I don't want to go in it. Say goodbye with a little hello in it. And say goodbye with shalom. Yes. <laughs> That's so great. Thank you so much. It's so amazing. It's incredible. Do you, are you ever going to stop? If your voice holds out, you're going to go. Go for it. That's the last That's part right. of you. That's going to make it there. That's right. That's right. He'll probably sing at his own funeral. <laughs> <laughs>